Welcome to Calvary Chapel of the White Mountains. We're uh, making the best of a bad situation. And uh, those of you who are uh, at home right now and, and watching this, uh, we, uh, we wish we could be with you. We wish you, we could gather together. Uh, right now, uh, we can't. Uh, we're trying to follow the governmental guidelines. Uh, there are a few folks here today, uh, and we are practicing the social distancing, but uh, we encourage you to continue to pray, uh, continue to, to uh, worship, uh, do as much as you can uh, where you are uh, while you can. Now, we will not have any worship uh, as far as singing. Uh, we know that uh, listening to God's Word is an act of worship. But in just a minute, I'm going to ask you to hit pause. And then what you can do, you can go online. Uh, there's a lot of good uh, uh, websites, a lot of good YouTube uh, sites that have awesome worship. And you know what? you get to worship to the exact music you want. You can listen to whatever songs you like, as loud as you want, as soft as you want, as many as you want, as little as you want. And you can praise the Lord. And when you're done, when you're finished worshiping in song and preparing your heart for the Lord speak to you, and then come on back and then listen or watch the teaching, okay? So with that said, go ahead and hit pause, and then when you're finished worshiping, come on back. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that even during these dark times, even during these times that, that we don't know, what uh, tomorrow holds, we're so thankful that we know that you know what's going on and that we know you hold us in your hands. Father, we pray that you would bless this time now. Lord, that you would speak to us, encourage us, strengthen us, and Lord, exhort us if that is what is needed. Father, we, we thank you for this time now. We thank you for your word and pray that you would bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of today's teaching is, Are You Where You Belong? I'm, I, I know you're probably not where you want to be, but are you where you belong? Since we were introduced to David back in 1 Samuel 16, we've seen how in many ways David uh, was a type of Christ. We've seen what a great uh, leader he was, a warrior, and we've also seen uh, a few of his shortcomings. Today, though, we're going to see David at his very worst. <laughs> we'll consider... How a man who, who loved God so much, a, a man described by God himself as a man after my own heart, who we've seen try to rule according to the word of God, we'll see how he could sink so low, how he could be involved in the depth of sin that, that he fell into in this chapter. And really, we'll consider why it happened, uh, how we can, can take what we see and, and apply them to our lives, uh, the things, the cautions, the things that maybe David should have done. We'll also consider the lasting effects of David's sin and, and how we can avoid all of that. So let's go ahead and start in verse 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 11. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now that sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? <laughs> at a time when kings go out to battle? Like, hey... 
springtime's here, who are we gonna go out and go to war against? Kind of like uh, you know, every every year they print uh, the sports teams and who they're, who they're going to play, you know, which ones they're going to play and on what day and and all that, where they're going to play it. Kind of like you know, okay, who are we scheduled to battle uh, this year, this spring? But really, uh, even after their defeat, as we saw in the last chapter, the people of Ammon continued to fight against Israel. And nations would usually suspend fighting during the winter. It would be very difficult to wage war then. You'd have to deal with the cold, the rain, the snow. Uh, chariots and horses get, would get stuck in the mud. And so they would wait until spring, kind of waiting for a more civilized time of killing each other. <laughs> and. So David, he sends Joab, his commander, uh, again with the army, and eventually Israel is victorious. And yet David, he stays at home. Kings were supposed to go there. It was a time when they went to war. It was a time when the kings go out to battle. And David, he stayed at home. He remained at home in Jerusalem. But look what happens while Joab and Israel are battling the Ammonites and David is kicking back at home in Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. <clears throat> then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So at the time... When kings go out to war, when David should have been with his troops, he gets bored, goes to bed early, can't sleep, he's tossing, and turning. You know, and maybe it's because he's feeling guilty for not going out to war. Maybe it's too warm in his house. But he ends up getting up out of bed, walks out on the roof. Now, in that culture at that time, uh, everybody use their roof as an extra room. It sometimes was used as an extra bedroom. Sometimes it was used a lot like a patio. People would eat up there, they'd hang out, just like you would on your patio at home during the summer months up here. Not so much in the winter, but <clears throat> he was up there and you know, he's looking around the city below. Hey, my kingdom out right there. And he's looking around, and all of a sudden he comes over here and ooga, he sees this, this beautiful woman taking a bath. <laughs> and she she's, you know, she's not just taking a bath, she's taking a bath on her rooftop. So what should David have done at that point? You know, we're told in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust. Flee, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Just turn away. You know, <laughs> David, go, turn away, man. Go to the other side of the roof. Go downstairs. Go hang out with one of your wives. You know, do something. Do something else. Think about something else. But what does he do? Look at verse 3. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So instead of getting out of that situation, which would have been the right thing to do, to pursue righteousness, David stays there. Actually, by staying there and asking about her, he's actually pursuing what he was lusting after. When he should have been with his men on the battlefield, he stayed home. He didn't belong there at that time. Being restless, he should have prayed, should have sought the Lord. We've all had those nights, right? We've all had those nights of toss and turn, just can't go to sleep. Sometimes we don't know why. Yeah, every now and then when I can't sleep, my wife will ask me, you know, well, what, what was the deal? Did you have something on your mind? Or is there something bothering you? No, just couldn't sleep. Yeah, well, what were you thinking about? 
not much. <laughs> and then I'll tell her sometimes the goofy things I was thinking about. You know, nothing I'm worried about, whatever, but just can't sleep. But my first pastor, he taught us that if you can't sleep, you know, start praying. Start praying and pray for everything that you can. And that's what I do. And then if I still can't sleep and I've prayed my brains out, I can't think of anything else to pray, then read the Bible. You know, get the Bible out and start reading. And I have uh, a tablet that I keep by the bed usually that, that I make it really dark and backlit so just the letters show up as white and it won't wake my wife up. And, and you could read that and be putting God's Word into your mind. And sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, as you're reading His Word, there's that peace that just kind of comes over you. And before you know it, you're sleeping. <laughs> and you, know, you shouldn't feel bad if you fall asleep at that time while you're reading the, reading the Word of God because, hey, that's what you went to bed for, for in the first place, right? You know, but David doesn't do that. He doesn't you know, do anything. You know, he could have actually went down to the tabernacle, woke up one of, one of the priests or whatever. Hey, man, let's pray together. Hey, I need to seek the Lord about this, that, or the other thing. But he doesn't do that. You know, when he saw this hottie taking a bath, he didn't take his thoughts captive. He let his mind go where it should not. And he took another step in the wrong direction. He inquired about her. Who is she? Is she available tonight? What's up? So he's one step closer to falling in sin. And that's what happens. Look at verse 4. Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. David, a man after God's own heart, has just committed adultery with a wife of one of his soldiers. And as we're going to see, this soldier was a, was a great guy. David has allowed himself to be led by his flesh. The carnal desires that, that every believer has to die to daily. Had he been where he belonged, though, he never would have faced this temptation. Had he turned away immediately after seeing this woman bathing, put his mind on other things, good things, he never would have fallen into the sin of adultery. In Philippians 4, 8, we're told, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Instead, instead of doing that, he focused on this beautiful woman, that he happened to see. Now, understand, she had her part too. If you're bathing up on a rooftop, and you could look up and see around, and, hey, that's where David hangs out at. That's where his servants may be from time to time. If you're there and you don't have a covering and all that, you know that somebody's looking. You know that somebody can see at least. So she had her part. Maybe, and may, maybe it was that, hey, you know, she was hoping to be seen by him. We don't know. But also, when David sent for her, she did not have to come. She could have said, no way. That's not right. That's improper. She could have refused when he sent for her. And, you know, he, he does this thing. He actively pursued that sin with her and had his one night stand. She goes home and it's all over. It'll never happen again, I'm sure David said that to himself. And nobody needs to know. It's done. But folks, understand, when we sin, when we won't confess our sin to God, try to hide it, and we don't repent, Numbers 32, 23 says, But if you do not do so, then take note. You have sinned against the Lord, and be sure 
your sin will find you out. Look at verse 5. And the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. Think about that. David's thinking, okay, man, it happened. Shouldn't have happened. Yeah, I know, but it ain't going to happen again. It's all done. Nobody's going to know. Everything's cool. A couple weeks goes by. He gets a note. I'm pregnant. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how he felt? Can you imagine that terror that kind of struck his heart? Oh, no. What am I going to do? What? What do you mean? She's pregnant. This wasn't supposed to happen. It was only one time. What am I going to do? And unfortunately, David isn't finished being ruled by his flesh. Look at verses 6 through 8. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah had come to him, David asked how Joab was doing, and how the people were doing, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah departed from the king's house, and a gift of food from the king followed him. So get that picture. The commander-in-chief, the president, the king, he sends a dispatch to General Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab obeys. Joab's got no idea what David wants with Uriah. And Uriah, all the way home, he's got to be wondering, what's up? Why me? What could the king possibly want with me? But he obeys. David pretends to be just kind of wondering, hey, you know, uh, gosh, I just wanted a battlefield briefing from you, Uriah. I hear you're a good dude. And so tell me, how are things going? And then after that, he tells him, go home, wash your feet. They stink. No, they, it's not that they stunk. Remember, they wore open sandals in that day. And, you know, there's even places in the New Testament, yeah, even where Jesus washes the disciples' feet there at the Last Supper. And he told them that, to, hey, you know, even if you've taken a bath, you still got to wash your feet. And that was the deal. That was a common practice in that culture that you would come to somebody's house or even your own house. And just before you went in, you would wash your feet. Kind of the practice like we're getting into right now as far as anytime you go anywhere, go leave anywhere, get your hand sanitizer out and, you know, and okay. And, and then you go home, you, you, you spray down again, you wash all your clothes and, and all that kind of stuff. How, you know, people building, I'm sure, their own decontamination chambers now. But there it was just wash the feet, wash the dirt off before you track it into the house. And... So he, he, he tells him to, to go home, wash your feet. And really, it, it would be kind of the thing that he's saying, hey, thanks for coming, Uriah. Good job. Go home and spend the night at home with your wife. You've earned it. David even sends a deluxe Harry and David gift basket to, to uh, Uriah's home for him and his wife to enjoy. Kind of a romantic night there. You know, David's thinking, no doubt, hey, well, you know, he's a red-blooded young man, and he'll sleep with his wife tonight, and everyone will think the child is his. But David hadn't figured into his scheme something about this soldier, Uriah, that he is a man of incredible integrity. Look at verses 9 and 10. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. So when they told David, saying, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Did you not come from the journey? Why did you not go down to your house? In other words, David said, Uriah, what's wrong with you, man? You've been gone so long. You had this big journey. You did your job, did everything you were supposed to do. Why didn't you go home? Look at verse 11. 
And Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. How bad, how panicked do you think David is feeling at this point? In fact, how bad do you think that he's feeling about what he's done to this honorable man sleeping with his wife? Well, apparently he's not feeling bad enough. He's still being driven by his flesh, still trying to hide his sin. He's still trying to look good without actually being good. David's now going to try again. Look at 12 and 13. Then David said to Uriah, Wait here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Now when David called him, he ate and drank before him, and he made him drunk. And at evening he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. Uriah's sense of right and wrong, his sense of duty and loyalty to his brothers in arms would not allow him the pleasure of being with his wife while they couldn't enjoy their wives. This guy is an extremely honorable man. This guy's a great example. Think of all the outside influence on Uriah at this time. He hasn't been with his wife for a long time. And no doubt, while he was deployed, every night, laying there in his tent or under the stars there, before he'd go to sleep, thinking, wow, I wish my, I was with my wife. Man, I miss her. Oh, boy, it's going to be great when this war finally ends. And I can go home to her. And then he's got the influence of the king's suggestion to go home. As far as the king's concerned, hey, Uriah, go for it, man, go home, be with your wife. It's okay. And even the influence of the alcohol couldn't sway him. You guys have all heard the, the old saying, no good deed goes unpunished. Well, look at 14 and 15. In the morning it happened that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him, that he may be struck down and die. That's the worst. Think about it. Think about how low David has sank right there. He sends Uriah one of the most honorable men in David's army with his own death warrant. Verses 16 and 17. So it was, while Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men. Then the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. See, Joab, he doesn't know why David wants Uriah killed. No idea. But he obeys. He shouldn't have. He shouldn't have done something like that. But we've seen before, several times, that Joab really wasn't overly committed to doing what was right before God, right? Joab, under the guise of a battle briefing, he lets David know, mission accomplished. Look at verses 18 through 21. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war and charged the messenger, saying, When you had finished telling the matters of the war to the king, if it happens that the king's wrath rises, and he says to you, Why did you approach so near to the city when you fought? Did you not know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubbasheth? Was it not a woman who cast a piece of a millstone on him from the wall, so that he died in Thebes? Why did you go near the wall? 
Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Now, David and Joab both would have been familiar with Judges 9, where a woman in the tower of Thebes dropped a piece of millstone on Abimelech's head. And as generals, and David, remember, he was a leader of, of uh, Israel's army during the reign of Saul for some time. Both of those guys, they would have studied previous battles to learn strategy and tactics from them. They would have been familiar with Ju Judges 9. And so Joab, he knows that David could get upset for, for Joab making such a dumb mistake. And so just in case, he says, just in case David starts getting upset about my tactics, let him know Uriah died in that battle. Verses 22 through 25. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent by him. And the messenger said to David, Surely the men prevailed against us and came out to us in the field. Then we drove them back as far as the entrance of the gate. The archers shot from the wall at your servants, and some of the king's servants are dead. And your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Strengthen your attack against the city and overthrow it, so encourage him. Oh well, people die in war. Don't, don't be upset, Joab. Hang in there and win the war. David's got to be thinking, okay, okay, that's taken care of. Nobody will know, but just to make sure I look good, look at 26 and 27. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. See, most everybody around, they'd be thinking, oh, what a nice guy King David is. Wow, how benevolent. Look at that. What a good guy. One of his soldiers dies in battle, and David takes his, his widow as his, his own bride. Wow. What a great guy. But the last thing we read there, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Literally, where it says displeased the Lord, in the Hebrew it's was evil in the eyes of the Lord. See, we may fool all kinds of people. We may be able to get a lot of people to think that you're the nicest guy or gal in the world. But God knows the truth, folks. And He is the one we will stand before. God has shown us His standards. God has given us His very Word. And that's how He will judge. So, what are some things that we can learn from this low point in David's life? James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, describes almost perfectly what happened. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. See, we see that digression in this incident with David. He had a weakness for women. He already had multiple wives, which he wasn't supposed to. We talked about that a few weeks ago. He was drawn away by his own desire, or really lust, and enticed by the bathing beauty. He failed to control his desire, and instead he pursued it, and ended up in sin with Bathsheba. Then, 
because he failed to repent and he wouldn't confess his sin to God, his sin continued to the death of Uriah. And just a spoiler alert, this won't be the only death from this sin. But folks, you and I, we need to remember. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 tells us, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Yes, it can happen to you. It can happen to me. You and I are not above falling during times of temptation. We need to admit it to ourselves. Hey, I could stumble. And then take the appropriate preventive measures. See, understand where David's at. He's not a kid anymore. He's probably about 50 years old. And things have gone well. God has blessed him. God has used him. He has, up to this point, an incredible track record. Incredible success. Things are going great. But he stays home at a time when kings go out to war. He allowed himself to be where he shouldn't have been. Because no doubt he thought, hey, I, I got it made. I've done all the hard stuff. Job could take care of this. I deserve to kick back. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the king. And you know, me and, me and God, we're, we're tight, man. We're like that. You know, there, there's not going to be a problem. I said, Joab, to do my light work. Yeah, I'll just hang out here. I've done enough of that going out to war stuff. Job 31.1, something we can learn. Stay out of this kind of thing. Job said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? That's a good thing. Job, when he was accused of all kinds of sin and all that, and you know, they're thinking, oh, you know, it's because you got lust in your heart. No, man, I made a covenant with my eyes. I am not going to check out other women. You know, I'm not going to look at other women. David could have learned from that. David could have benefited from that, making a covenant with his eyes. You know, I'm not going to look at a, a young woman. And sometimes you cannot help but see something, but you don't have to look. You don't have to keep staring. You have to check things out. Like, whoa! One time, a buddy of mine and I came home, and my wife didn't know that I had a friend with me. And we went into uh, this one room, and she comes in. She's walking down the hall. You know, honey, are you home? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm back here. Well, she, she didn't have a top on. She was just wearing, wearing her bra or something like that, and, or a towel. That's what it was. She was wearing a towel. And my buddy, you know, he couldn't help, but, you know, you know she's coming, talking, and so he sees that. But I thought my friend was going to get whiplash. He turned away so fast. Uh, man, that is the right thing to do. That's what David should have done. You know, he should have turned away quick. He should have not gazed on this woman, checked her out. Romans 13, 14 tells us, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You know, don't look. And if you happen to see, look away and get out of there. Don't keep yourself in a place where there's more temptation coming at you. And it's not just dealing with, you know, this kind of lust there. But if it's drinking is doing drugs, or any kind of sin. Don't put yourself in a place where it's easy to fall. If you got a, a, a strong temptation of getting drunk, don't buy booze. Don't go to parties where they're drinking booze. Don't keep booze in your house. That's just that easy. You know, you, you don't make provision to fall into sin. And then... You know, get out of there and do something good. Do something right. Do something you should. Put your mind on good stuff, like Philippians 4, 8 said. When we do sin, and, you know, we do, go to God. Confess it. Turn from your sin and receive the forgiveness that Christ died for. One of my favorite verses, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins 
and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what we need to do. David didn't do that. And we'll read, probably next week, we'll look at one of the songs that David wrote during the time when he tried to hide all this stuff. He eventually does confess to God that he has sinned. But right now, he's not. He's doing the wrong thing. And it led to the death of Uriah. But it all starts, folks, with being where you belong. And a lot, a lot of folks right now are, are stuck at home because of the coronavirus. And you know what? That's where most people belong right now. Out of love, doing what we can do not to spread COVID-19. And we also, though, no matter where we're at, whether we're at home or if we're still kind of out and about, we need to be ready to be used by the Lord. To be used by the Lord in the life of those people around us. You know, we can talk to our neighbors, keeping six feet apart. We can get on the phone, Skype or, you know, whatever, and, and encourage people. We can pray with people. We can find out, hey, are there any needs that you have? How are you doing with food? You need some eggs? You know, what, what can we do? How can, how can I help? And we could do those kind of things. You don't have to give them a hug when you bring whatever they need to them. You can give them a call, whatever, set it on their porch and say, okay, it's there, and you can take off. Then they can go there with their 10-foot pole and bring it in and go into their contamination chamber, disinfect everything, and use whatever you brought to them. But another place that we belong right now, no matter where we are physically, folks, always and especially now during this time of crisis, we belong before the throne of God in prayer. We need to be constantly praying. In fact, like 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without ceasing. No matter what you're doing, no matter where you're at, if you are where you belong, then you can go to God in prayer. And see, one of the problems with being where we don't belong, when we're where someplace where we know we shouldn't be, we won't go to God. I don't want to talk to him. He's going to ask me, why are you here? You know, what are you doing right there? Oh, no, you know, so I'm not going to pray. No, get ourselves where we belong and come before him in prayer. And no matter what happens, no matter what's going on, whatever, whatever you're doing, whether you're tossing and turning in bed at night like David was, or whether you're just driving down the road, cooking a meal, sanitizing your house, whatever. You can be in prayer. But you can talk to the Lord. So folks, let's continue to trust the Lord. Let's continue to trust Him through this whole thing because, as we said last week, He loves us. He's with us. He's not going to leave us nor forsake us. And let's stay where we belong, holding on tightly to Jesus. Amen? <clears throat> let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You so much that no matter what's going on, no matter where we're at, what we're doing, who we're with, we can come before you and lift up our needs. We can cast our cares on you because we know you care for us. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to, to do our part, to do what's right, and to stay where we belong, all the while knowing that you are at work and that you will do what is best for us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.